Hello everyone, thank you for joining. I think this is the third event of the Spectators Alternative Conference. Um, and first off, obviously, uh, the Spectators hosting this general thing, uh, conference, but I wanted to start by thanking our sponsor Barclays for sponsoring this panel. Um, the topic today, out and into the world, can Britain reclaim free trade? So as Brexit talks reach what could be the final stage, um, whether that final stage leads to more talks or no tunnel, uh, I, we seem to be at a point where no matter what happens with the UK's talks with the EU, clearly by the end of the year, we are at a crossroads for the UK's trade policy. Uh, we know that uh, many trade agreements have already been rolled over. We have had in the Japan deal, the first uh, deal the UK has struck, which goes further and beyond what we had under uh, the EU arrangement. And there's a hope in government that there'll be plenty more to follow. Um, yet, uh, we still don't know when we might hear about a UK-US trade deal. There are questions about whether China, clearly one of the largest economies, is one that the UK will be prioritising or seeking to do business with in that sense. And then we get back to the EU. So to discuss all these things on ultimately both the on an international level and also I think the frictions back in the UK does seem that we often pick up the papers and hear about uh, Tory differences of opinions too on what should we prioritise in these free trade deals. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by a panel today that I'm just going to run through. Then I'm going to ask all the panel members to give a two minute or so address. I've been told to be very strict in that, um, but we'll see, we'll see how my time counting goes. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion, um, but I also want to get as many audience questions in as possible. So if you do have something you want to ask one of the panelists, um, I think the way to do it is you write it in the Zoom chat. Um, technology will hopefully all be well there and um, I will get through them all. We have to finish on the dot by 10.45. Sorry, 11.45, otherwise this conference would already be over. Um, and I think, hopefully, after much work, the S behind me is the right way. Great. Okay, so we're good to go. So with that, I'd like to welcome our panel. Um, so we are joined today by James Binns, Global Head of Trade and Working Capital at Barclays. Uh, Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm sure everyone has read uh, many of Mark's pieces on uh, why a no-deal Brexit might not be so bad and also what we should be looking for on free trade. Um, Adam Marshall, Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, and last but by no means least, uh, Liz Truss, Secretary of State for International Trade. Um, so to kick things off, I would normally do ladies first, but actually Liz, I'm thinking we're going to go to you last. You get the final word in a way that way. Um, so let's start by hearing from Mark. Okay, great. Well, Katie, thank you very much. I'm, uh, this, this is one area of the world where I'm optimistic about um, thanks in part to the efforts already made by uh, Liz, who's joined us today. Uh, but I think much done, much left to do. I just want to make a few points which uh, give rise to my optimism, but just a couple of warnings as well. Firstly, benefits uh, of trade are about the only thing that governments tend to radically understate. Governments have a tendency to promise that any uh, enterprise they're engaged with is going to bring absolutely sensational rates of return, whether that's HS2 or spending on education or anything else. Good evidence to suggest that we understate the benefits of freeing up trade. Uh, I suspect that the deal that we've, stuck with, uh, that we've struck with Japan will be enormously more beneficial than the official forecasts. Uh, New Zealand is the standout example on this when, when they set their trade deals with um, China, they thought it would be worth about 350 million U uh, New Zealand Kiwi dollars a year. In fact, it was 4.2 times that. And that's because trade has a dynamic uh, effect. It's not just a question of cheaper and higher quality products coming into the market. Uh, it is a question of what you do with those products. Uh, secondly, we've got to be clear we're playing multidimensional chess here. I think a problem with the previous government was that we were playing chess with the EU, not realizing that surrendering a pawn or a rook on that chessboard had implications for the deals that we might make with Japan or the USA. Um, the EU chessboard matters a lot, but it's not the only game in town. And if we put all of our focus on that, uh, then uh, Liz's job in trying to strike deals with Japan or America is made enormously harder. Thirdly, and Katie, you, uh, you um, mentioned this, we've got to put our trade team in charge of our regulatory rulebook. Uh, in effect, although tariffs matter, it's regulation that matters more. 
And if we're going to take a position that there can be absolutely no change to our banking standards, our insurance standards, our animal welfare standards, our health and safety standards, none whatsoever, then we're sending our trade team uh, into uh, negotiations with both hands tied behind their back. This is a challenge of trying to align or scrap uh, regulations to smooth trade and I am concerned that there are voices on the conservative benches who are making our ability to strike deals harder. Um, but ultimately we've got to, uh, we've got to understand and I'm, I'm not going to go so far as to correct you Katie because I think you're right that the end of this year is a crucial point that will set our trajectory for our relationship with the EU going forward but we have to start looking at trade and trade deals as an incremental process not that we get to some single unified deal with the EU or America or Japan and that's it it needs to be reiterated year after year after year after year uh, with, with regard to Japan we should be going back every year and trying to improve that deal um, if we, wherever we get to with the EU, whatever deal we struck, or if there's no deal, that will not be the final word. We should be uh, continually returning to the table. Again, I think the Kiwis have got this right. The European Union and the mindset of the UK in general, the media classes in particular, gets it wrong. It's as if we're going to write a text and that will stand for all time. No, you've got to keep going back and back and back. And the last point I'd make, if I'm just within my two minutes, this is an interesting area in which game theory comes up against economics. I think a lot of economists would say unilateral free trade is the way to go. Just because other countries are blocking up their ports doesn't mean you need to block up your own ports. Uh, if the Germans or the Japanese or the Chinese want to sell us stuff cheaply, we should buy it. Uh, that, I think, has good economic theory behind it but ignores the game theory that our politicians such as Liz need to go through, that if you go to the table saying we're going to scrap all of our tariffs on you come what may, your position of negotiation to encourage them to remove tariffs on us is limited. So I think that's an interesting tension. I think the, economics, the economic textbooks would suggest just declare unilateral free trade now, but if we want to actually get back to our historical position of being the greatest pioneers of free trade in the world, then we need to actually use that leverage to get others to embrace free trade as well. And that requires tough negotiations, not merely economic theory. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, now, James, do you wanna give us your opening remarks? Thank you very much, Katie. I'm delighted to be taking part in today's panel and thank you for the invite. I'm really looking forward to the discussion ahead. At Barclays, we've been supporting trade for over 300 years for UK businesses. And today our focus on trade remains as strong as ever. Uh, trade is absolutely part of our DNA. We've got specialist trade teams across the UK and indeed across the globe. We have a range of comprehensive trade solutions aimed at small, medium and large size businesses. There's a lot going on at the moment. There's Brexit, there's COVID-19, there's US-China trade tensions, uh, to name but a few. And for UK businesses, that means volatility, complexity and uncertainty. We see trade solutions and trade support as being absolutely vital to helping those UK businesses navigate the current environment that we're, 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 we're working in so that they can not only minimize risk and uncertainty, but also seize new opportunities. And in that regard, it was fantastic to see the new U, uh, US, uh, sorry, UK, uh, Japan trade deal being announced recently. And I congratulate the Secretary of State for International Trade in that regard. We're working very closely with organizations like UK Export Finance, the Department of International Trade, other organizations like the Institute of Exporters. We and I feel those organizations, those departments, remain absolutely critical to helping us all navigate through these, um, these waters that we currently stand in or swim in. <laughs> and uh, we're working very, very closely with UKEF and Department of International Trade in particular, to help UK businesses. Once again, I'm delighted to be taking part in the panel today, and I'm really looking forward to the debate ahead. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. And now let's go over to Adam. Katie, thanks very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I suppose I'm here today representing business communities around the UK and some of their point of view on what the concept of free trade means, uh, both in terms of their current and future operations. 
Uh, interestingly, and perhaps a bit provocatively, I'd say that from the point of view of business, the phrase that we're using to describe today's seminar, reclaim free trade, is a bit of a strange turn of phrase uh, because businesses never actually felt they lost it in the first place. Governments may have lost uh, uh, some of their zest for free trade, but I don't think businesses ever have, and it's important to remember that distinction. Um, so the better question I think we need to answer is whether our politicians and our leadership embrace what a free trading environment really means and avoid a retreat into a bit of a narrow or more protectionist view of our economic future. Uh, we've seen that happen in other places around the world. Um, thankfully, here in the UK, we have not. And I know that the Secretary of State, when she comes up to speak, will probably very firmly reject that sort of protectionist view of the world. But invariably, uh, the sense in business communities is that would, of course, make us uh, significantly poorer over the long term, going back to Mark's point about the benefits that trade can have. Uh, just three very quick points of introduction from me. The first is to always remember that businesses, not countries, do trade deals. And they need active championing and they need active support from governments and from financial institutions uh, in order to close them. Trade agreements between countries, such as those that the Secretary of State is working so hard to achieve, make those business to business deals easier but they are not the end in their own right. It's the businesses actually doing the trading and doing the deals between themselves that is the goal we are all seeking to achieve. I think the second point is that businesses are of course pragmatic and many will go where the demand is. So if they notice that a market is opening up post coronavirus or that the speed of the recovery in that market is greater, many businesses will reorientate their attention relatively quickly. And of course, they will do the same when there are favorable conditions from a free trade uh, agreement. Um, and then I suppose finally, on those trade agreements themselves, the things that the Secretary of State and many of her cabinet colleagues are working so hard on, there is a prioritization from the established business community in the UK as to when they need to be achieved and what needs to be achieved. The top priority still coming up from the grassroots is to get that free trade agreement with the European Union over the coming weeks seen as extremely important to do uh, by many of those who are established in business. The second is to continue the work that the Secretary of State and her predecessor were doing on continuity agreements around the world. We too uh, very much applaud the Japan deal. It can only work to its best extent when we combine it together with a good European deal and with others around the world because of things like rules of origin, et cetera. Um, and then finally, of course, businesses are hugely interested in what can be achieved with the US, with Australia, with New Zealand, with other markets all across the world for so many reasons. Uh, but I suppose the message still is, let's try to get an EU deal done because that will be a baseline for many others and help many others in future. Great, now Liz. Well, thanks, thanks very much. And you know, in answer to the question, can Britain reclaim free trade? Yes, we absolutely can. And I think we're in a superb position to do that. No other country has been in a position of being able to simultaneously negotiate so many new trade agreements at the same time. We're the sixth largest economy in the world. We're a very, very valuable consumer market. And what I'm seeing is lots of countries want to come to the table to talk trade with the UK. Uh, we've got a strong pipeline of others who want to be involved in negotiations. And I think we're in a real position to make the UK the center of a network of free trade agree deals, a, a hub, if you like. And the crucial components of that, first of all, accession to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which securing the Japan deal is a crucial stepping stone, but that's why also Australia and New Zealand uh, will be very important, as will the likes of Canada and Mexico, but also the deal with the US, uh, on which we're making significant progress. We've just been exchanging market access offers in terms of the tariffs, so we're getting into a deep level of negotiation with the US. And I think this is important economically for Britain. You know, we've very much been EU-facing, and of course the EU trade deal is important, but there's an opportunity for us to reach out more widely around the world and champion Britain's key strengths in areas like financial services, data and digital, small and medium-sized enterprises, food and drink. 
and also hitch ourselves to the fastest growing areas of the world. You know, we've got to not just look at the status quo of where trade is now, but also where trade will be in the future and how can the UK benefit that. But more broadly than just the economic benefits, there are the geostrategic benefits of trade. And we've got an opportunity to work with like-minded partners to shape the future rules of trade. The WTO's rule book hasn't been changed significantly since 1995, you know, when the internet was in its inception. And the UK is a leading country in areas like digital and data. And I think you've seen from the Japan deal that the UK is prepared to go beyond what the EU is willing to agree with you know, in areas like the free flow of data, anti-data localization, which would give a huge strategic advantages, not just to our tech companies, but also in areas like financial services and fintech. We've also been able to go further on mobility, so the ability of professionals and their families uh, to travel between the UK and Japan. We've gone further in rules of origin, adopting more liberal rules of origin, which will benefit British business, which tends to, you know, we are a trading nation, we import and we export. So liberal rules of origin are important to us. We've gone further in protecting our intellectual property, whether that's for the creative industries or whether it's for food and drink, where 70 uh, British geographical indications will now be able to be recognised, whether it's Cornish clotted cream or the stored away black pudding. So I think this shows the future of British trade and where we want to go. You know, we, we are a leader in services. We're the second largest services exporter in the world. We can help shape those global rules now, working with like-minded partners. But the final point I make, and it really goes back to what Mark was saying about the economics, He's right, and we are conducting a new study to look at the economics, particularly in areas like digital and data, that the traditional gravity model, which is based about how far a country is from another country, doesn't really capture fully. But also, trade agreements are important to protect us from protectionism, because they lock in the benefits of low tariff barriers, low non-tariff barriers to trade in a world where even before COVID, countries were putting up barriers. So it gives British business security that they know that they're able to trade into those markets on those terms into the long term. So it's important both for the positive benefits, but also for locking in a more free trade world. And also making that argument on the global stage. The Prime Minister in his Unger speech uh, on Saturday talked about lowering tariffs and how the UK global tariff is setting the example for others in terms of low tariffs on COVID critical goods like medical supplies. So I think the UK really has an opportunity to play a leadership role in making the case for free trade once again. Great, thank you Liz. Um, now, as I said, please do write any questions you have into the chat function and we will try to get to those. Um, just a few uh, questions picking up on some of the points in the opening remarks. Um, Adam was talking about the sense amongst the business community at least that, you know, uh, the EU trade deal is still seen as the biggest one, the most valuable. Liz, I just wondered if we're looking at obviously the transition period coming to an end, the idea of lining up lots of deals ready to go, big progress they made in terms of Japan. Um, have you found that any countries ultimately want to know the shape and the details of an EU deal or a lack of deal before they can really get over the line? What other countries have wanted to know is that we're going to have our own independent regulatory policy and we're not going to be dynamically aligned to the EU. That's a very important principle, whoever we're negotiating with. So given that's the case, given that we've said that we are going to have sovereignty over our rules and regulation, whether that's on sanitary and phytosanitary or whether it's on technical barriers to trade, that has enabled us to commence and make real progress in the negotiations, whether it's with the United States, Australia, or New Zealand. Now, of course, the US, EU trade deal is important, but we have to remember over time, other parts of the world are going to become relatively more important. First of all, because those are the places of faster growth. And secondly, because as the UK develops its own independent regulatory regime, we will be able to get better access to those markets so the EU has never achieved 
a trade deal with the US, but it's also been unwilling to accede to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a high standards agreement, has strong areas like digital trade. So over time, I think we'll see a shifting of where the UK trades with. But of course, the EU will continue to be an important trade partner. No one's, no one's denying that. Adam, whether you're um, looking, I suppose, at the trade deals that can potentially have the biggest impact, um, clearly the EU deals one we hear the most about is written about most in the papers. But what other countries do you think, um, some of the percentage of GDP can look uh, fairly minuscule, but this is a process um, when you're looking at these, but it's more than that. So I wondered what countries do you think it's important that, you know, beyond the EU, we, we should be focusing on? Well, uh, of course, there are still some outstanding countries with whom we've had trade agreements via our membership of the EU that are very important to British business. Canada is a key example, which I know the Secretary of State and her teams are working on yes. quite hard mm -hmm. right now. Um, you know, we, we've seen the progress that's been made on countries like South Korea, like Japan and others, and that's extremely positive. So there are a few more of those continuity deals that have an important impact that we that we would like to see. Uh, in terms of other markets, I think there are, are those where there are big op economic opportunity and there are those where I think there's some psychological importance uh, attached to uh, doing uh, some sort of agreement. So if we were to take Australia and New Zealand, uh, you know, strong friends, good trading partners and very willing business communities to do more with us. When we talk to the British Chamber of Commerce in Australia and the British New Zealand Business Association, desperately keen to see more happening between the two markets. Those won't have the biggest economic impact of, of all of the deals that could be made, but they do have a psychological impact on our businesses and draw them out into more markets on that side of the world. Um, there's huge interest, of course, too, in British business links with the US. They're all already incredibly deep. I suppose the question that we are asked regularly, however, is we have these deep links on the basis of WTO. If, for whatever the reason, a huge uh, all-encompassing trade agreement is not necessarily an easy thing to do for the reasons of the multi-dimensional chess that Mark was referring to before, what steps can be taken incrementally and over time to continue to improve UK companies' trade access to the US and vice versa so that we can continue to build on that fantastic relationship, uh, you know, whether it's on investment, whether it's on mobility or anything else. Because there are ways, of course, to boost trade between markets without the one gigantic framework trade agreement. You can go incrementally as well. And um, Mark, on that, I mean, I suppose, and, and you touched on your opening remarks, there is a tendency in the media sometimes to think of these kind of big blockbuster moments where everything comes together. So do you think when, I mean, you've written previously about why actually uh, not reaching a trade agreement with the EU would not be the end of the world. There could be some pros even. So what do you think are the things that we should be seeing in the next couple of months, six months, which will show we're on the right track, even if, you know, that, that is not that, you know, that big photo off of, you know, a world leader and Boris Johnson or, or Liz. <laughs> Well, to, to pick up Adam's point, I mean, you, you pick the low-hanging fruit first, right? So, uh, I mean, it would be completely ludicrous if we got into a situation with the EU in which there are, however long it was supposed to be, the queues were predicted to be in Kent if there's no deal. I mean, it, this becomes absolutely ridiculous. And, uh, you know, the my, my baseline is to avoid catastrophic disruption. Uh, even were that to happen, I think that it's likely that politicians would be forced around the table to deal with that and to, and to start to, if you like, negotiate a trade deal from the floor up rather than the ceiling down. With regard to the EU, we're trying to negotiate the trade deal from the ceiling downwards at the moment rather than the floor upwards. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be phlegmatic about uh, even more disruption after COVID-19 in the economy uh, but at the very least you want the you, you want the administrative position with the EU to be smooth and if there's a very thin deal or you know some just sort of memorandum of understanding to make sure that sort of stuff can be turned around at Dover and Calais then that's something that, that needs to be built on and I think there is a tendency in the media to sort of say right this is the deadline this is the date this is the text there you go that's frozen in for formaldehyde forevermore and that just won't be the case I'm expecting 
people have been sort of saying, oh my God, when will Brexit be done? When will we get it over with? And the answer is never. Uh, because we will be negotiating our relationship with the EU forevermore. Our, our relationship with the continent of Europe and how we trade with them is a perennial feature of uh, our trade policy and our international relations and foreign affairs policy, whether we're a member of the European Union or not. So I, I would say I agree with Adam. Let's be incremental about it. Uh, I applaud uh, Liz's efforts to get comprehensive trade deals in place. If you can knock on the head a thousand things at once in a document, hurrah. But if you can't, that's not a reason not to knock one or two things on the head. I mean, if we can't agree with the Americans on, let's say, agriculture, let's at least try and reach some sort of agreements with them in mutual recognition of professional qualifications, for example. Uh, so it's just a question of continually moving the ball inch by inch closer towards the goal. If you can actually score a spectacular screamer of a goal from the halfway line, hurrah. But if you can't, just keep moving the ball forward. That goes for the EU as well as it does for the other parts of the world where we might be able to strike a deal. James, um, I wanted to, uh, Mark touched on obviously coronavirus. Um, in a way we should, it feels that you can't have any conversation about talking about that at the moment. But do you think coronavirus and clearly the difficulties in the months ahead in terms of the restrictions we're expecting, the fact this would, you know, this idea of the V uh, recovery seems to be slipping further and further out of sight. Do you think there's an extra incentive now, both, you know, in, on the government, but in terms of banks, the business community to reach some kind of agreement with the EU? I certainly hope so, Katie. Um, I think um, I think that will that will happen. I think to some extent, people are already coming together around COVID and realizing the impact that's having not just on national economies but regional and global economies. Um, but it was interesting to listen to some of the commentary from Mark and Adam earlier on. And one of the things I'm very keen on, and I hear from businesses that we talk to, is a clear export strategy um, from the government. And I know um, that there was an export strategy which was published in 2018. Uh, and I believe that's being refreshed at the moment. And we've certainly um, been talking to Department of International Trade who've asked us for our input to that. But I think having that clear roadmap um, for UK businesses um, and um, identifying what the clear focus areas are, geographies, sectors, products, and so on, as part mm -hmm. of that strategy, along with the support that will be available for UK businesses, uh, is absolutely critical, because that's really what they need at the moment. They need a degree of certainty, not just for the next two or three months, but for the next three to five years. And Adam, one of the things uh, you hear when you, when you speak to figures in government about the prospect of not having that agreement with the EU is the sense that businesses are not prepared. Now, I think we can, depending on who you speak to, the blame can go either way. Some say, you know, actually the government guidance is there, but lots of businesses have been very busy adjusting to coronavirus and there's not been that uptake. Others, you know, blame moving deadlines. Do you think the business community is in a place to go for a no-deal Brexit? Do you think there have been adequate preparations? Obviously, we're hearing about things like the lovely Lorry Park. Well, Katie, certainly business communities don't want to have that disorderly scenario at the end of December. And if you look at British Chambers of Commerce research, you've got 51% of businesses in a very, very timely and up-to-date survey saying they do not believe that they are fully prepared and that they have not been able to make uh, the preparations that are required. Now, I will put uh, a challenge to government, as the British Chambers has done repeatedly with our uh, Brexit uh, checklist. We have identified 35 areas over the course of the last four years where businesses need clarity and detail and, and, and really strong guidance in order to be able to prepare adequately for change. Whether that's a no deal outcome or a deal outcome, you need this baseline level of clarity. And of those 35 areas, you know, a preoccupying number uh, are still rated either red or amber, i.e. no information or not enough information to complete those preparations. So what a lot of businesses are telling us is they're doing what they can with the information they have, but there are still some very serious gaps out there. 
Um, and I think they would take very badly if at the end of the year, the finger of blame was pointed at them in some way and say, you didn't use the time that you had adequately. Because the response that you get back from grassroots businesses is, the time that we had to do what? We did not have the clarity, the detail on some of the regulatory policies, for example, on uh, some of the, the, the questions around conformity assessment or any other level of detail um, you know, in time. So there's a real challenge and it's a real joint enterprise, I think over the next three months for business and government to try to ensure that that detail is there, business has the clarity it needs, and those that haven't taken those steps really do use those weeks that are remaining. We've got a lot of questions coming in from the US and farming, and I want to want to get to those. But just before we do, touching on what we just heard, Carla has written in to us, what action should businesses be taking to prepare? Sounds like that could be the million dollar question. Does anyone on the panel want to have a go at answering that? Otherwise, I'll assign. Oh, Mark, great. <laughs> well, well, I, just, I mean, I've got a lot of sympathy for what Adam's saying from the business community side. Because of course, over any reasonable time frame, you want certainty. And actually, in some ways, it's easier to um, run a business knowing that the future position is going to be thus and so, even if you think thus and so is a bit mediocre or complex, than having no goddamn idea. You know, it's easier to know that whatever the regulatory framework will be a four out of 10, than having no idea at all whether it's going to be a one out of 10 or a, or a nine out of 10. So it seems to me that the, the prepare for the worst and hope for the best is probably the, the appropriate uh, position for a business to take. But I have sympathy with what Adam's saying, that the clearer that the government can give, I mean, it can't give certainty, this is uncertain. We don't know whether there's gonna be a deal or not. There are so many moving parts. I mean, there's, you, the, the government could not in good conscience and with honesty say, this is what is going to prevail from the 1st of January next year. They don't know, and it's not in their gift. But I think that the more the government can do to give a sort of tree diagram, you know, if X, we will do Y, if Z, we will do A. Uh, so businesses can then chart through whichever process we're going down and what would be expected of them. That provides certainty as much as the government can realistically do so in a very uncertain world. Great. Right, I'm going to move on to US and Liz, this question I think is one for you. It's from Dr. Bogdan. Sorry if I mispronounced anyone's names. And um, how far are we from concluding a deal with the US? Now we're about to go, well, we are in a US election, so that does complicate things quite a lot. So where are we at? Yeah, so a lot of countries we're trading with seem to have a habit of having elections. Uh, the New Zealanders are also having an election, which has uh, compromised our... Uh, negotiation schedule but we will we will progress anyway so i think it's worth just addressing what mark said earlier about trade agreements under wta rules the vast majority of trade has to be covered in any free trade agreement so it's not the case that you can just pick off a small element of trade and come come to an agreement on that because of the most favored nation tariff rules you do have to make sure the vast majority is covered in any agreement you reach. And in each of the negotiations we're having, each country has its offensive interests. So no country is going to do a deal just on the basis of the other country's offensive interests and not go get what they want. So inherently, these deals have to have a certain amount of comprehensiveness in them. So it's not just because politicians want to get a great headline mark. It's also because of the WTA rules and the nature of the trade-offs in the agreement that you have to achieve a certain amount. But of course, there are differences between the shallow sort of agreement and a deeper agreement. So, you know, I would argue the Japan agreement we've struck is deeper than the one the EU struck uh, because it covers areas like data and digital in much more depth. So there are varying degrees of depth, but I think each agreement has to be a basic FTA level in order to pass muster uh, on the WTA rules. And as you rightly say, all of these deals are constructed from the floor up. And that's what's very different between the negotiations I'm doing at the Department of International Trade and the EU negotiation, which is starting from the top down. And so where we are with the US is we've pretty much laid all the text on both sides. We're now in a position of consolidating those texts. So if you like, that's laying the foundations for the deal. 
debating the various chapters and where exactly we get to on those at the same time as discussing the tariff reductions that we want on key areas of goods. So we are in the middle, if you like, of creating that foundation for a successful deal. Now, of course, we'd like to make as much progress as we can in advance of the US election. And because of the way the US system works, they can carry on negotiating pretty much right up to that so that we can try and realize the benefits as quickly as possible. Also, the US Trade Promotion Authority, which allows an up-down vote on a deal in Congress, expires mid-next year. So that is an important point for us to try and reach an agreement by. But I'm always very clear on all of these deals that we will not strike a deal that doesn't work for the UK, regardless of what the deadline is. Because as Adam pointed out, we've already got a good trading relationship with the US. We're only going to do a deal with the US if it improves on that trading relationship and it gives us more of what of what the UK wants. So in respect of farm standards, which was the question you asked, Katie, you know, we've imported all of the current EU law on farm standards. So the ban on chlorinated chicken, the ban on hormone injected beef, you know, those remain. Of course, over time, we will have the UK's own regulatory framework for agriculture. You know, we're leaving the common agricultural policy. We're developing our own policy, which is more focused on the environment. You know, we are a country that cares deeply about animal welfare. So those are the types of policies that we will be developing over time. But it will be a gradual evolution. You know, the world is not going to change in terms of farm regulations on the 1st of January 2021. And what we have to do with the United States and also with all the other partners we're negotiating with is come to an arrangement where we have um, an agreement that reflects our priorities whilst enabling access for our producers to other markets and then to us. And of course, that goes into huge amounts of detail. But what we have is we have people representing the farming industry closely involved and in advising us on the negotiations. So we know what every line we agree, what every tariff change we agree, it will work for British industry and consumers. But it's, a, it's of course a vastly complex area to go into, but we've been very clear in our manifesto, we're not going to undermine the very high standards we have in Britain in, in any of those agreements. And I think it's perfectly doable to get a successful deal with the US that takes that into account and likewise to accede to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is another strategic priority. So in terms of deadline, we're looking at the middle of next year as a potential uh, important one to reach. So Mark has warned me against deadlines. Now, there, I want to talk about farming standards a little bit more, but first- I wouldn't use that as a deadline because <laughs> the point is we will not do a bad deal just to hit a yeah. deadline. But I do think deadlines can be helpful in focusing minds. So with respect to Japan, you know, we needed to do it a certain amount of time in advance in order to go through the process in the UK Parliament and also the Japanese diet. And that was useful for focusing minds and getting a win-win deal for both us and Japan. And that is the approach we'll use. But of course, if the other party is unreasonable, we're not just going to say, fine, we'll sign up to your terms. A potential date of interest for people's diaries who follow trade policy, we're, we're going to call that. Um, now, Mark, just I wanted to stay on food standards. Ellen has asked, what is Mark's position on dropping food standards in trade deals, especially with the US? Now, often we hear about chlor chlorinated chicken. There's also other ways you can obviously uh, have competing food standards, potentially cheaper options on the market shelves. So can you t talk us through where you stand on this? Yeah, I mean, in my view, it should be based on the science. I'm not a scientist. Uh, my limited understanding of the science is that hormone injected beef and chlorinated chicken uh, don't pose a risk to life and limb. I have never met or come across or heard of any British person visiting the United States and refusing to eat chicken or beef there on the grounds that it is chlorinated or hormone injected, not one. I mean, you might re refuse to eat chicken or beef on the grounds that you're a vegetarian, but that would apply uh, either way round. 
So my broad approach to it, based on the science by all means, I mean, I'm open to persuasion that, you know, if we let in this particular food product from this particular country, it has risks of, I don't know, salmonella or whatever, anything else. Um, that is one consideration. I'm, I'm less moved myself by animal welfare standards, to be honest, um, uh, but I appreciate that's a government policy. And, and then what I would say, which sounds a bit trivial, basically label things properly. Um, uh, as, as long as the consumer is aware of what they're purchasing, I would like to maximize consumer choice. I quite like American chicken and American beef, and I'd like to be able to buy them in Tesco's, not just in Las Vegas when I go on holiday. So the science should guide it, choice should guide it. Um, and um, the last thing I would say there, which where Liz is right, uh, completely right is that too often there's a massive focus on agriculture which is actually a relatively small part of GDP uh, if we can't agree on chicken and beef I'll be uh, disappointed but it's not exactly the end of our deal our trade with America is not chicken and beef focused particularly far more important to get more technical things over the line about public procurement policies alignment on financial services uh, and the rest of it but uh, my view is have the science, maximize consumer choice, and ask yourself, is this really a problem we're facing, or is this cloaked up protectionism to defend the interests of the British producer rather than the British consumer? Yeah, Liz, just on that, and then I want to go to the rest of the panel. I mean, just this weekend, you had Jamie Oliver and Joe Wicks joining the cries, you know, urging the government to not to open the floodgates to low quality food imports. Um, now, low quality, clearly conscious of many views and it can often feel as though we spend the whole of this debate talking about chlorinated chicken and hormone injected beef but it's also the case I think during the EU referendum and since since Boris Johnson's win there are plenty of Tory MPs who particularly in our, I think blue barricade red wall constituencies whatever you want to want to call them and um, do you see a tangible benefit of leaving the EU for their constituents as having cheaper food options on the supermarket shelf. So do you think that we are going to see that come through in a potential UK-US trade deal? So first of all, I think there's a huge opportunity for British producers globally. I was in David's day last week looking at their cheddar exports. They're now exporting to the US and Canadian market. And even though the US have a 25% tariff, the cheese is still competitive because it's such high quality. And that is the future of British produce. It's high quality, high welfare goods, which are in demand across the world. So I think part of my argument would be that we should be more positive about what we have to offer the world. It's often looked as a one-way trade, but we've been very successful. We're now a net exporter of dairy products for the first time in years because our farmers are doing a great job and because there is demand for high quality British products across the world. Of course, we're not going to compete with Brazil for producing that volume, but in terms of quality, I think British farming is unbeatable and we should be proud of that. There's also a misnomer that products in the US are cheaper. In fact, the price of beef in the US is pretty much what the price of beef in the EU is. So I think there's a idea that you know, there'll be floods of products is not, is not true. I think the genuine point that a lot of farmers have expressed to me is they would consider it unfair if practices that are banned in the UK because of animal welfare reasons that are allowed elsewhere, if those products were allowed to come in and undercut the standards that our farmers are asked to follow, then that becomes difficult. And I, I agree with that which is why in any trade deal we negotiate, we will be taking that into account because we don't want to undermine the standards we're asking our farmers to follow. So I think that's an important principle. But that doesn't mean that we can't trade with the United States, that we can't trade with Australia, New Zealand and other countries. And in fact, there are already quotas for high quality US beef into the EU, uh, there are other products that we import. And what trade deals are all about is trying to work out where the opportunities are. And I think now we've left the EU, we don't have to have the high tariff wall. We don't have to have the protectionist common agricultural policy. We can be uh, more open, but in a way that suits 
British interests and also the British perspective on these issues. So that is something to me that is perfectly possible to navigate. But what isn't helpful is just scare stories about chlorinated chicken and hormone beef when it's already banned in the UK anyway. And I think there is a fair amount of sort of bandwagon jumping, if I could put it like that, that doesn't reflect the negotiations we're actually having. Are you going to give Joe Wicks a call then and uh, share some truth bullets? (laughs) (laughs) I'm very happy to, Katie. (laughs) Um, Adam, I just want to bring you in at this point. Um, that I want to talk about other countries and trade deals because we spend a lot of time in the US, but I just want to, particularly the US, because clearly it sounds as though, you know, few people expect anything before the election, you know, which is too, very material. Do, do you think that there is a sense in the business community and generally, um, you know, at the commerce that there has been a, a slow... Uh, sort of a, a slow path to getting these trade deals signed up? Or do you think everyone thinks this was kind of the schedule anyway? Is there going to be disappointment that some of these things don't come sooner? Well, I- invariably, Katie, in business, when people want to do something, they want to do it yesterday. And anyone who is sat where, where Liz is right now is always under that pressure to do more as fast as possible. Um, and, and businesses do want to see as, as many of these framework agreements uh, and, and trade agreements as possible materialize within a short time frame. So to the discussion previously, we can get to some of the certainty that they bring and, and the opportunities that they bring. Um, I, I suppose, though, Katie, there was one thing I wanted to add to a point that was made a little bit earlier. Uh, I don't want to drag the debate back to agriculture because that's not where I actually am on this. But I do think the British media and political lens focuses on one small area of many trade negotiations to the detriment of all of the others that are out there. So I'm sitting here representing businesses who say to me, getting stuff through customs processes in the US is what adds a huge amount of paperwork and time to my business. Um, I'm an SME, you know, some countries have preferential arrangements for SMEs to trade with each other with lighter rules. When can we get something like that? Or on mobility, moving people between offices in different countries, which matters to them. Uh, Or as Mark mentioned, getting into procurement uh, and being able to go into a market like the US and not face very high domestic barriers to participating in procurements there. All of this B2B stuff, rather than the consumer facing stuff, is a big part of what is going to make us rich through trading more with other countries. It needs a much better airing and more visibility out there over the months ahead. So colleagues in the media could do all of us a great service by talking about the slightly less sexy bits of trade negotiations and trade agreements because they really do matter to the national bottom line. Okay, James, I'll bear that in mind when I next have to write something. Um, now, uh, so James, the, the question I had for you, uh, thank you, Adam, uh, is ultimately, we have a question in just about free trade more generally. And I know you were saying in your remarks earlier, uh, you know, supportively of it. And Natalie has asked, does complete free trade actually work in the modern world? Aren't the various strands of trade too wide ranging? And I think you can probably bring into that. Coronavirus in a way appears to be, have be, been, or at least encourage arguments of self-sufficiency of in some cases protectionism, if you look at how uh, we've seen the problems of supply chains on things like PPE. Um, so you see some countries moving away from that. So do you think the case for free trade has been made more difficult over the past few months? Um, James? Um, yes, I think it has. I mean, certainly if you're Adam Smith, then you definitely think that free trade globally is the right way forwards. Um, but frankly, the reality is that free trade globally is unlikely because there are so many different viewpoints out there, are so many different interests out there. And all of that has been complicated by some of the issues that I referenced earlier on. So COVID, trade tensions, etc. cetera. Um, and to some extent, rise of nationalism and local production and so on. But I do think we need to continue to move towards free trade because I do think it's beneficial for businesses and people uh, globally. So, we should always be moving towards that maxim, even though we may never ultimately get there um, and making that progress uh, in that regard. One point I just wanted to make earlier on and add to what Adam was saying about um, customs and cross-border facilitation in terms of border friction. And I think this is a valid point is 
technology is now starting to pay uh, or play a big role in the movement of goods and trade finance in general. Uh, over the last three years or so, we've really seen a significant increase in the move towards digitization, blockchain solutions, supply chain finance platforms, and so on. And COVID is really turbocharging that whole move at the moment with everything that's happened. And one of the challenges to achieving that nirvana, if you like, is different technical standards, different legal standards, different regulations across different countries and regions governing the acceptance of electronic documentation. There are some countries like Singapore now, which are very focused on trying to be a hub, uh, which really starts to try and encourage standardization across regions and across trade corridors. And I think the UK could play a very important role in that going forwards to help facilitate the digitization of trade, to help facilitate the movement of goods and services across borders and reduce border friction. Thank you. Now, um, when we're talking about big economies, countries that clearly could make a big impact in terms of our uh, economy on growing it, China can't really be avoided. But at the same time, it does feel as though the government has taken, uh, I've been correct in the past when I said hostile, but I think depending on which Tory MP you speak to, it definitely feels that at least in the parliamentary Conservative Party, you have a, a bloc arranging across various factions who want a tougher approach with China. And we've seen parts of that uh, in various things like Huawei, uh, some disquiet over TikTok. Um, Mark, what do you think the UK's approach to trade with China should be? Um, it feels we're a long way now from the golden era that we heard about when George Osborne and David Cameron were in charge. Um, but yet we cannot deny, obviously, the, the, the global superpower in a way that China is. So what should yeah. we be doing? Well, I, I think this is more of a sort of question of geopolitics than directly of trade. Um, there are enormous problems with China. When Liz gets to sitting down with her Chinese counterparts, the, the scale of the problems that she faces are considerably greater than talking to her Aussie American or Kiwi counterparts. I mean, how can you sign a trade deal with a country that has such an outrageous record on defending intellectual property, for example? Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're almost in the courts before you start. So uh, I would, you know, I, I would like us to have a peaceful, meaningful and trading relation with, relationship with China. But you're not really just starting at the floor there and building up. You're somewhere deep in the cellar and building up, right? I mean, you're, you're, you haven't really even got the foundations in place. So I see that as high, high hanging fruit. I mean, the sensible thing to do, uh, you know, if, is to get the deals over the line, which are the easiest to achieve broadly speaking, the democratic world to some degree, the English speaking world, I would probably have more focus and more optimism about India um, than China in terms of getting a, a, a deal over the line. I think the wider Commonwealth should be a target. So I'm not a Sinophobe, but I, but I think that there is a geopolitical question here, which isn't just about the easing of trade and that we start from a pretty bleak position in that it is difficult to patrol what's actually happening to, for example, British or American IP when it enters the Chinese market. So that is the longest, hardest, um, highest hanging fruit. And to get to any kind of free trade deal with China is going to take many, many years of pushing water uphill. James, what do you think to that in terms of how, as a country, we should be approaching China? Um, because, as I was saying, there was a point when it was encouraged and there were various businesses that went to strengthen ties. And, and now it feels there's been a very uh, sharp shift. I mean, from our perspective, we will obviously follow the direction that our clients or customers who are UK businesses ask us to try and help them follow. Um, and if that's China, then we'll help them with China to the extent we can. If it's the US, then we'll do the same. Um, so I don't think it's really my place to discuss or opine on um, uh, how we negotiate with, with China. But I would say that absolutely we're here to help Business, UK businesses deal with countries like China, as indeed the US and other, other countries. Sure. Liz, do you think China is a country that you expect to be doing much business with in terms of looking at trade agreements? Um, Neil O'Brien, uh, MP in your own party, who uh, what is, what holds a position on the China Research Group, has said that ultimately the problem is, is not really a country that itself practices free trade so therefore if you look at how you know it can fund itself the various wings that people say are not so much businesses but wings of the Chinese 
government, it's hard to do that. So do you think it is, there is something to be done there? Well, it's certainly the case at the World Trade Organization that uh, alliance of the US, Japan, the EU, and also the UK are challenging China's practices. So in areas like forced technology transfer, uh, subsid subsidization by state-owned industry of products, uh, the IP issues that Mark was talking about. And I, I think there are serious issues at the World Trade Organization in terms of the operation and countries following the rules, which are, need to be fixed. Obviously, we've got Liam Fox as our candidate at the moment, uh, pushing, pushing that, that argument. But the WTO is in serious need of reform. And my view is the way the UK should work is work with like-minded allies to create structures that fundamentally challenge the way the WTO is operating and force it to reform. And the, the primary vehicle for that is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a high standards agreement where countries in it follow the rules. It operates in areas like data and digital that the WTO do not have uh, advanced rules in as well as the United Kingdom, there are a number of other countries seeking to accede uh, to TPP like Thailand. So I see that as a growing group of like-minded countries who can challenge the way that the WTO uh, operates. I also agree with Mark about India. I think India is a very strong prospect for the next phase of our trade agreements. We've had a very good JETCO uh, with the Indians recently. We've got another one this autumn uh, to prepare the ground, but of course India is a major world democracy and working with like-minded democracies to shape the global rules, I think is very important. Great, now, because we only have a couple of minutes left and I've been told I have to end on time, I thought we could end by just going around the panel and within 30 seconds to one minute, um, say what you think is the most important thing the UK could do right now, you know, in the coming months to reclaim free trade. Um, who would like to go first? Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah, give, give Liz Trust more power and more staff, probably, is the most important thing we can probably do to facilitate free trade. We are never, ever going to get... This is complete, nodding in case we um, We're never going to get complete global free trade, of course. We're never going to get a complete level playing field. There will always be people complaining about unfair competition. I was just looking up the minimum wage in the UK is £8.21. The federal minimum wage in America is £5.60. So there's always going to be, uh, you know, a, a lack of a level playing field. But we need to uh, act according to the principles articulated by Liz and the Prime Minister. Even if we're not going to get total global free trade, uh, world free trade is like... Is, is like looking up at the stars. You're not ever going to reach them, but you benefit enormously from their presence. And Adam? Uh, the biggest thing we can do to reclaim free trade over the coming months is remember trade isn't just about policy. It's also about promotion. We have fantastic companies in this country. Uh, James's point before about having a strong export strategy uh, and being able to help all of those companies get out there in the world, regardless of whether they're operating under a trade agreement or not, is absolutely critical. We also need to spend more as a country on the promotion of our trade. The budget that we have to do this big mission is very, very small at the moment. We don't want to spend on wisely or throw money away, of course, but I do think we need to invest in it if we're really going to make it happen. James, you get the penultimate word. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, for me, part of this is about thought leadership and it's about projecting the UK, Britain as a real thought leader in terms of um, trade, free trade, export strategies and so on going forwards. That will help us develop the right partnerships uh, inspire the right confidence and hopefully influence others to do as we want to. And I'm sure we're doing all of that. I mentioned earlier the technology and dig digital and data elements. I think that's important and that falls into that thought leadership element. Um, and earlier on in my presentation, I mentioned the importance of UK Export Finance and the Department of International Trade and other departments like it to continue to invest in those. Um, in my view, those, uh, those departments are absolutely vital uh, in working with UK businesses and with banks such as ourselves to help facilitate our, you know, our clients and UK businesses trade. 
And Liz, you get the final 30 seconds before I have to cut everyone off. Well, first of all, I'm very grateful to everybody's support for DIT's spending review bid. Thank you very much. We'll be using that in our evidence to the, to the Treasury. I think it's very important we make the case because there are always going to be naysayers, there are always going to be doubters, there are always going to be protectionists. It's an easy knee-jerk argument to make. So what we need is businesses, thinkers, to actually be out there on the front foot challenging some of the misinformation uh, that gets spread on the media about trade because we're, we're doing trade deals because it benefits businesses and consumers here in the UK and it's part of our future prosperity. And then the final point I'd make is we do have friends around the world. You know, we do have like-minded allies that believe the same thing. We've got great countries like Australia and New Zealand who have led in free trade. I see it as we are coming to join them uh, and work with them. So let's not just think it's us making that argument. There is a broader group of countries, Japan included as well, who also want to make the case with us. Brilliant. Thank you, Liz. And thank you to the rest of our panel. It's been a really interesting discussion. And thank you to Barclays for sponsoring today's discussion.